My name is Lee Gilliland. I'm an assistant professor of radiology at Emory University School of Medicine. And today I'm here to talk about how to support faculty and trainees during early parenthood. Objectives are to sustain supportive environments, to take away a structured approach to easily implementing resident focus groups at your institution, to recognize factors contributing to the struggling resident, and to apply mentorship strategies and utilize resources and to learn to define success in your own terms. In 2019, over half of all medical students are female. One fourth of radiology residents are female and one third of radiologists are female globally. A 2019 Journal of American Medical Association study found that 23% of young female physicians work part-time compared to only 5% of men. This study also found that this increased 39% of women working part-time or having left medicine altogether within six years of completing residency. When asked for reasons, 78% of these women cited family as the main reason for underemployment. These brief stats highlight the discrepancy between female and male medical careers. The United States legal history as it relates to childbearing and adoption began in 1978 with the Pregnancy Discrimination Act. This was enacted to require employers with medical disability plans to provide for disability due to pregnancy. It prevented discrimination in the hiring of pregnant women and also in the termination of women because they became pregnant. Unfortunately, this law did not require for accommodations or modifications of duties and if women could not work at full capacity, uninterrupted by pregnancy, childbirth, or related conditions, they were subject to termination. In 1993, with the Family Medical Leave Act, women were granted 12 weeks of unpaid maternity leave. This only applied to organizations employing at least 50 employees within 75 miles of a work site who had worked for at least 12 months and who had worked for 1,250 hours during the previous year. This applied to birth or adoption and to care of ill family members. In 2010, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, Section 4207, covered reasonable break time for nursing mothers and granted a place other than a bathroom for them to be able to express breast milk until one year after birth. Although the Family Medical Leave Act only provides unpaid leave, state laws do provide paid leave in five states. California grants six weeks of paid leave at 55%, Rhode Island, four weeks, New Jersey, 12 weeks to care for a child or a parent, but not yourself, and Washington grants 12 weeks and another two weeks if there is a pregnancy complication, and New York grants 12 weeks. These policies were created through employed paid payroll deductions and administered through the disability programs. A 2018 study on childbearing and family leave published in the Journal of American Medical Association revealed data from 15 graduate medical education sponsored institutions which were affiliated with the top 12 medical schools. All 12 of the medical schools had maternity leave policies for faculty physicians, but only eight of the 15 sponsored institutions had a paid leave policy for residents. Of the ones that had paid leave for residents, 6.6 .6 weeks was the average amount of leave granted to the residents. 8.8 .8 weeks was the average amount of leave granted to faculty. This is disparate from the 12 weeks allotted by the Federal Family and Medical Leave Act. American Board of Radiology. Many subspecialty boards have limits on the amount of time residents can take off during a given year. The ABR recently changed its policy allowing leave to be at the program director's discretion. Residents are no longer required to make up that time. Now we'll switch to another industry competing for young STEM talent, and that is the tech industry. Tech companies have recently revamped their leave policies in order to attract and keep young STEM talent. Outreach, for instance, offers 12 weeks of paid maternity leave, and after a woman returns to work, they offer a night nurse five nights a week 
and meals two nights a week. Microsoft offers 20 weeks of paid leave for women and 12 weeks of paternity leave and 12 weeks of adoption leave, as well as $10,000 in adoption cost. They offer three cycles of in vitro fertilization, genetic testing, and embryo freezing for up to four years. Amazon and Zillow offer discounted child care as well as backup care. International leave policies. A 2011 international study of 141 countries determined that longer maternity leave led to longer periods of breastfeeding and would allow children to stay home before being placed in group daycare settings. These things allowed for healthier infants with less infections. Also observed was the ability for women to work led to positive outcomes regarding gender equality and income. Members of the European Union must provide 14 weeks of leave, but this varies from country to country in how much is paid. The United Kingdom, for instance, offers 52 weeks of paid leave at up to 90% of earnings of wage for 29 weeks, and Sweden only offers 12 weeks at 80% of earned wages. Norway offers six weeks of paid paternity leave for fathers, which is among the most generous. However, they will not allow this to be transferred to mothers as they feel it is important for fathers to also stay home with their infants. These paid leave policies are funded through payroll taxes, national insurance, and or income taxes. It was determined that the best policies offered paid leave did not allow paternal leave to be transferable between parents, have universal policies, have a funding mechanism, and allow for scheduling flexibility, including returning to work part-time. Recent studies have shown that the cost of employee search, selection, and training can be reduced by adopting enhanced paternal leave policies. Tech companies have already implemented very competitive leave policies as we discussed earlier. BuzzFeed, for example, has a return to work rate of 95% versus the national average of 57%. Employees that are more productive at work are less likely to have absenteeism, which is when a worker arrives late, leaves early, or misses work, and presenteeism, when a worker is on site but not fully functioning because of issues in the home or illness. Which leave policies can we bring to radiology to create a more supportive environment? I believe these are among the most important policies. To include paid maternity and paternity leave for birth, adoption, and surrogacy. To include same-sex couples. Transparent policies that are the same across all institutions. Financial incentives for other staff or residents who will take more call because of leave. Alternate work schedules for faculty, including part-time, four-day compressed work weeks, or alternative hours, either early or late. Teleworking or home reading stations. Family independent care programs, including on-site daycare and backup care. Flexible spending accounts for dependents and care subsidies. Lactation support services. Wellness programs, including fitness classes and on-site fitness. How do we maintain supportive environments? Barriers exist even in the best programs, and this can be due to insufficient marketing and residents and faculty do not know about the programs that are available to them. Support has to come from the top down. Supportive division directors, residency directors, and chairs are imperative. If culture supports utilizing policies in place, faculty and residents will take advantage of these policies. Human resources should work with individuals at all levels to ensure that culture is one that does not penalize for utilizing services. Mentorship programs and counseling should be strongly encouraged. Ideas for implementing support groups. Residents should be assigned a mentor who is a person he or she can go to for support. Ideally, this person would be someone who's had a similar life circumstance. Counselors should be available and potentially assigned if a resident is struggling. Human resources personnel should also be very active in educating not only residents, but faculty as to benefits available. Benefits should be clearly discussed before employment. 
and there should be a system in place to reprimand those who penalize people for utilizing leave and services set out to help new parents. An environment should be one where residents and faculty feel free to voice concerns. It does no good to have extensive policies if the environment is such that people are afraid to take leave when they should. Hi, this is Shelby Fishback. I am the Diagnostic Radiology Program Director at the University of Kansas Medical Center in Kansas City, Kansas. And I'm going to talk to you guys briefly today about our experience utilizing focus groups to solicit resident feedback. And I had to include at least one picture of my residents celebrating the Kansas City Chiefs Super Bowl win. So here you go. So our agenda for our short talk today will include starting with why we decided to develop our focus group sessions. Um, our specific structure for how we do it at KU, and spoiler alert, it's free and simple. And so if this is something that you're interested in and you think it would be beneficial at your program, it's something you could institute very, very easily. We'll give you some examples of some feedback that we've received through focus groups that we found very helpful, uh, changes we've made both at the program level and at the departmental level uh, through uh, feedback that's come from focus group discussions. Uh, areas for improvement and how we've done it and how we'd like to improve things going forward and then future directions for our focus groups. So why focus group? I don't know about you guys at your programs, but our feedback system is you know, suboptimal in that the residents fill out these monthly evaluations and I look at the feedback, but I just end up having more questions and wanting to discuss it more with them to really drill down on why they answered questions a certain way or why they feel a certain way about various rotations. So we really wanted to do something beyond MedHub. Um, we really wanted to have discussions around different rotations and really drill down on some of the major issues to really figure out how we can improve our program. And one of my prior partners, Luke Ledbetter, who's a neuroradiologist now at UCLA, brought an article to me and he said, you know, this is done in market research and social research. Why are we not doing this at the GME level? And when I was putting this talk together, I started by asking my chiefs what they thought about focus groups. And Sam Hunt, who just graduated from our program last week, he said, well, I love focus groups because first off, I think that surveys suck and I would rather participate in a focus group to provide feedback. And he likes that it adds a human element and produces constructive conversations. So back and forth conversations where you can really identify issues and ask pertinent questions about those issues. Um, it's anonymized nature, really allows for honest feedback. And it allows for discussion regarding if changes actually took place. So there's an ability to close the loop if you continue to do these focus groups year after year. Cameron Smith, our other chief resident, his thoughts around focus groups were that it's critical to understanding heavily nuanced situations with complex processes and where social factors play a large role. He thought they were not only useful in defining what participants think, but most importantly, why they think that way. And that's really critical to why focus groups are helpful. So in terms of our structure about how we do it and who's involved, um, in terms of the number of focus groups, we usually do one to two per month. We don't have them in June because everything is so busy and um, your senior residents are on their way out and then in July with new residents. So we've decided to take those two months off. We schedule them during our normal noon conference time, so they're anywhere from 45 to 60 minutes. Um, on the schedule, our MedHub and our Outlook schedule, it just says focus group, but it does not say which residents are scheduled for that focus group. And there are two trainees per PGY level and one to two chiefs. And again, I don't know which residents are scheduled, um, and nobody does except for the coordinators. Um, in terms of the coordinators, um, you can see a picture of them here. Sarah Hartman on the left, who has really been kind of the driver behind our focus group structure, and David Acosta on the right. And they both participate in each focus group, one serving as the facilitator, asking the questions and having kind of a back and forth interaction with the residents, and one serving as the scribe. And there is a focus group dedicated to each section every year. So for example, we every year have one ultrasound focus group, one pediatric radiology focus group. We have one for emergency radiology. And then the one that's a little bit unique is we have one dedicated to our research curriculum. In terms of the rules of focus group, so what happens in focus group stays in focus group. And this is really true. It is extremely confidential. 
None of the staff know which residents are attending which focus group or which focus group is assigned to a certain day. You can't, you can't de determine that by looking at the schedule. No staff uh, are in there, including PDs. So it's a little bit bizarre that I am giving a short talk about something I've actually never witnessed firsthand. And I talked to you about the lecture calendar title, how to keep it very brief and vague. And so nobody really can tease out who's involved in any given focus group. So here's the list of the general questions that are asked in each focus group. Um, and you can see them here listed. I won't go through all of them, but some basic questions like, what do you like about the rotation and dislike? Um, how is the clinical teaching at the workstation? And going forward, we will certainly add, how is the virtual teaching? Um, what do you think of the quality of the lectures? Have you felt prepared for the required examinations in that certain section? And then I really like this question, are there areas that are not covered in the lecture series? So this provides you the ability to really identify any major gaps in the core curriculum for each section. Other questions like how is the clinical volume and workflow on this rotation? So you can really tease out uh, the service demands versus the educational um, participation by the faculty. Um, and you can read the rest here, but these are the ones that the uh, coordinators ask of the residents um, at each focus group. In addition to the general questions that are asked at every focus group section, each uh, division can provide two to three additional um, questions that are specific to their questions, things they're wondering about. And so these are examples of add-on questions. So for example, how does one prepare prior to the start of the rotation? Uh, what are your expectations for X rotation? Uh, what are the perceived strengths and weaknesses of the neuroradiology fellowship program? So kind of drilling not down on how are fellows affecting uh, the resident's experience in education. And like I said, uh, the, our research and quality group wanted to have a focus group dedicated to their uh, curriculum and education. And so they provided some questions that are specific to that experience for our residents. So um, you can see them listed here. And again, these are a little different than the general questions I showed you for the other rotations. So what happens after the focus group has um, met. And the first thing that happens is the coordinators type up the notes. They kind of organize them in a kind of coherent fashion. Um, we sit down and we look at that feedback, um, the program leadership, the chiefs and the program directors. And then we provide that information to the chair who reviews um, that information with the division directors at their meetings. And in a perfect world and the, how the system is supposed to work, the division directors choose two to three, quote, action points to address from that focus group feedback. Here are some examples of some changes that have come about as a result of our focus group feedback. So more cross-sectional imaging for R1s on it, rotations like MSK and chest was a big kind of message that we heard in our focus groups. Um, earlier exposure to MRI, more frequent feedback um, is a, definitely a theme um, throughout focus groups, um, kind of universally on all rotations. So residents really would like feedback, not just at the end of the rotation, but more frequently throughout. Um, one of the other things was a biopsy simulation lab, which we now have every year. And you can see a picture from that above. Um, and then other just various workflow improvements that seem like little things um, to change on a certain rotation, but they really add up to significant improvements in workflow and resident education. So not surprising, um, you can see from this very kind of data-driven analysis here, um, that the residents much prefer um, the focus group kind of format for providing feedback versus the traditional Likert evaluation. Areas for improvement. Um, there are definitely areas that we can improve on this. Number one is being more consistent in how we close that loop. So making sure that that feedback is available to our chair um, every time he meets with the division directors to really um, review that and provide some actionable items from that feedback. Um, personalities. Some people think that this is very helpful. And as you can imagine, um, I'm sure in your department, others think that this is not as helpful. So it's really kind of sometimes managing different personalities. And one of the most important things I think about focus groups is making sure that the residents know when change has come about because of some information that they provided or a discussion they had during focus group. It's important to know that they're heard and that things have changed because of their insights and their suggestions. 
In terms of future directions for our focus groups, one thing that we're excited about um, instituting this coming year is a focus group specifically on wellness, uh, which this was pre-COVID. So now more important than ever is really focusing on resident wellness and resiliency. So we're excited for that. Uh, we also really want to have a, a more standardized uh, education snapshot to share with our chair and division directors. Uh, we're looking at a one page, uh, easily digestible document where they can look at the feedback and easily tease out two to three things that they really want to um, pay attention to and develop as action items going forward. There are several people that I want to thank. First, Luke Ledbetter for even coming up with this idea and bringing it to us. Um, our program coordinators who absolutely 100% drive the focus group structure at KU. Sarah Hartman, most importantly, because she's the one that really um, took this under um, her wing and really made it something that's successful and the residents really enjoy. Also, David Acosta for his role in focus groups. And then both... Um, uh, current and past chief Sam Hunt, Cameron Smith, and Hosnain Hisham. Here's our brief list of references. If you have any questions at all, please feel free to reach out to me, Shelby Fishback. Um, you can see my email address there. And then Sarah Hartman, who I said is the driver behind our focus group um, format and structure, and she's been phenomenal in really driving this and making this um, a success. So I would encourage you to reach out to her um, as well. Thank you very much. My name is Rebecca Letty. I'm from the Medical University of South Carolina. Today I'm going to talk about mentoring the struggling resident, giving some tips and tools. My objectives of my talk are to look at factors contributing to the struggling resident and apply different strategies, look at resources, and develop a mint of some remediation plans to assist the struggling resident. So why do residents struggle? Three main reasons residents can struggle are knowledge, skills deficit, and attitude or professionalism issues. So regarding knowledge, um, this may be struggling to not prioritizing time to study. It could also be studying incorrect materials. It can be poor test taking skills as the residents or trainee suffering from test anxiety, lack of preparation, poor sleep, nutrition, um, difficulty dealing with pressure. Regarding skills deficits, residents may struggle with deficiencies of hand-eye coordination regarding clinical procedures, lack of having the radiologist eye, um, inefficiency regarding to time management or dictating reports, having reporting errors or grammar issues. And then attitude may be another res reason residents struggle. So are they dealing with professionalism issues? Do they have a lack of emotional intelligence or self-awareness? Um, are they burnout? out? Are they having difficulties um, with psychological challenges? Professionalism, as you know, is an ACGME core competency. They define it um, in specifics of what it means to be a professional and have treat people with respect, compassion, and dignity. Professionalism as well has been emphasized in the revised Milestones 2.0. There are now three professionalism domains specific for radiology. Plus there's also a practice-based learning and improvement number two, which also is based on reflective practice and commitment to professionalism growth. So how do we officially recognize that a resident is struggling? So there's objective measures based for medical knowledge, how is their ACR in-service exam. We at our institution have the residents take the RAD exam for each rotation, so we can look at those scores. Case conferences, are the residents struggling there? Do you have the residents take pre-call tests, specifically on-call, are they having more misses than their peers? And then also daily view box, procedure interactions with the residents, um, listening to feedback from the other attending res radiologists, the residents, other ordering physicians. How about rotation evaluations? You can understand if a resident's struggling. And then overall in the clinical competency committee. Recognizing that a resident is struggling with more attitude professionalism can be a little more difficult. Do you have some objective measures that are documented by feedback from the attending radiologists or residents or ordering physicians. Specifically, have they had a patient safety incident report? 
written up about them? What about any violations in confidentiality, privacy, and privacy or HIPAA violations? Are they performing less than expected on the milestone assessments? And again, in the clinical competency committee, are attitude and professionalism issues coming up? Some examples of residents that might be struggling with this portion of attitude or professionalism would be not performing administrative tasks. There are uh, disrespectful or disregard for work responsibilities. They're not answering their pagings. They're withholding vital information. They're refusing to demonstrate competence long term. The overall poor attitude. Um, also, social media and professional behavior um, can be a sign that a resident's struggling with this issue. All right, so we've looked at ways that residents may struggle, knowledge, having skills issues, as well as attitude and professionalism. Now let's talk about some ways that we can help our struggling residents. Mentoring, having a formalized mentorship plan within your program can really help um, to deal with residents, to identify residents that are struggling and help them through this process. Uh, formalized mentor plan. We have one at our institution. It starts in our first year. The residents come in and are assigned a mentor and then throughout the rest of their residency they can either keep that mentor or change to other mentors depending on what they, how their career is developing. But mentorship allows a dynamic relationship to foster for professional growth. You at the mentor and mentee relationship, you can set expectations, set meeting times, set that this is a confidential environment. You can provide feedback, both positive and negative. We're really wanting to mentor the both the bad and the good as well. Um, it allows for setting of goals, developing of career development plan, um, and really to be aware of what's going on with trainee um, and help them that if they're struggling. Other resources, it's important to know at your institution what resources are available. We at our institution have an employee assistance program. So this is a work-based um, program designed to address productivity issues as well as assist employees in identifying kind of any um, personal or occupational concerns that can affect job performance. This provides counseling services, whether it's mental health, substance abuse, personal issues. There's also, it provides some test taking strategies. We at our, in our program, um, allow the residents to all have an appointment with the employee assistance program designated to them. In the beginning of their R1 year, we do not force them to attend the meeting, but it's there if they would like to use it. We've actually been asked this year by our um, R2 through R4s to continue making appointments for them so that they have this resource if they want to utilize it. And then overall, just an attitude of focusing on wellness for the radiology trainee. So looking at mental, emotional, and physical wellness. Here's some specific examples of ways that we can help a struggling resident um, regarding the medical knowledge component. Um, having residents specifically develop study plans with specific reading assignments, case reviews, maybe some physics modules and questions, giving them specific exams, whether it's the RAD exam, which we use at our institution, um, have a specific requirement of a percentile that they're supposed to make or a number of questions. Um, having a specific conference attendance. Regarding the skills, if they're having difficulty with procedures, we want them to be logging the procedures, asking for feedback. We provide ultrasound guided procedure skill labs to those that are struggling. We actually do initially a skill lab for everybody in their R1 year um, and then may, with those that are continuing to struggle, offer other skill labs. And then if they're having issues that continue without mentorship guidance and some of these earlier interventions um, and they might have a more serious or prolonged deficiency in some of these issues, we may need to put them on a remediation plan. We have put residents on just a remediation plan through our program that's not officially through the GME office just to kind of kickstart things to identify that they're struggling and form a plan to help them. And then as well, we've also done more formalized remediation plans through the GME office. The point of these is to obtain a basic understanding of what the struggler issues are. Um, 
to create some s successful strategies to under overcome what they're struggling with and really engage the resident um, and then give details, expectations, remediation outcomes, and any consequences if they don't complete the remediation plan. We form our remediation plans based on the SMART objectives, so we want to be specific. So objectives should, should specify what they want to achieve, something that's measurable, be able to measure whether we, the resident is meeting the objective or not. They are achievable, realistic, and we want them to be time set. Here's an example of one of our formalized um, through the GME office um, a me remediation plan based on medical knowledge and skills deficits that one of our residents struggled with. So again, we had very specific um, goals that were set up. If you look through this chart, um, we wanted them to attend daily noon conferences. They had to take specific RAD exam at the end of each rotation and we gave very specific objectives. They will demonstrate improved medical knowledge by this milestone objective. They will not have a miss rate over their peers within two standard deviations. They'll have conference attendance greater than 80%. Their in-service score should be greater than 40. They will log procedures. So again, very specific objectives. Then you're also giving the consequences um, of what happens if they do not meet this remediation plan objective measures. Um, you also say the requirements should be meeting with the faculty mentor and the program director. Here's an, another example of a remediation plan on a resident that struggled with professionalism. So again, we identified what some of the issues were that we wanted them to um, perform demonstrate improved professionalism, how we were going to do this. We had them do self-assessments um, monthly based on professionalism examples. They had to do a self-reflection analysis. They had to pick a mentor, a role model of professionalism, and meet with them. We gave them online modules and other resources. They had to not have any um, patient safety events about them and or they also had to reach certain milestones that were based on professionalism. And again, meeting with the faculty mentor monthly and the program director, and then they understood what the consequences would be if they did not meet these objectives. Here's just some examples of our professionalism reading requirements um, for those residents that are struggling with professionalism. And then finally, here's another just example you can read through of a resident that was struggling with both medical knowledge and professionalism. Again, giving very specific objectives um, and then expectations and consequences if they don't meet the remediation plan objectives. So in summary, I think you, each program should have a plan in place to recognize if the resident is struggling. We want to be able to act early. We want to know about our institution and program resources, have a strong mentorship within our program, and then if needed, form a remediation plan that might not go through the GME office, might even be program specific, but it allows for a specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time sensitive measurements and consequences um, that can help the resident to really focus and overcome some of these things that they're struggling with. Thank you very much. The first time I gave this talk, uh, a woman came up to me afterwards and uh, said something to me like, thank you so much for giving a talk about trauma. It's a difficult uh, topic to talk about. And I sort of thought to myself in that moment, oh my gosh, I did just give a lecture about trauma that actually wasn't what I had um, truly set out to do. Uh, but her point was well taken because I think that when toxic behaviors at work really become a problem for people, it's because they have risen to the level of trauma. And that's not often recognized in the advice that's given to people um, about how to navigate them. So what I'm going to talk about today is that there are really um, a couple categories of toxic behaviors. Uh, one that I would characterize as being a little bit more institutional or leadership driven, and a second that is more based around a, a single individual, a toxic individual, and a recognition that there is a real spectrum of severity in both of these categories as to how uh, how toxic something is. Uh, sometimes it's you know merely a nuisance. Sometimes it can be quite trauma-inducing. 
And then I'm going to talk about some different coping strategies um, as, as to um, how to deal with these specifically directed towards how severe um, the behavior is. So before we sort of jump into that, uh, we should define this first. What am I talking about? A toxic behavior is generally defined as something that is capable of causing serious harm to a person's health and well-being. These are destructive to work culture and happiness. They typically result in people uh, decreasing their effort at work. That often translates to decreased time spent at work, decreased quality of work. People sort of lose their desire to be there, not surprisingly. They can result in distress, uh, a feeling of betrayal, anger, depression, anxiety, and as I've already mentioned, trauma. And not surprisingly, this tends to result in turnover. People do leave their jobs because of a toxic work environment or even just a single toxic person that they're having to deal with on a regular basis at work. So it's a real problem, um, both for the affected individuals and for the institutions who are uh, absorbing this decreased work effort on people's behalf. So what am I talking about uh, with these different categories? So uh, things that I would categorize as organizational or leadership toxic behaviors. Uh, a famous one, top-down decision-making. A lot of these sort of center around decision-making, actually. Closed-door decision-making, where people don't feel involved in the process. Bias decision-making, which can mean a lot of different things. I think that uh, particularly right now, at this moment in history, people are sort of waking up to, but uh, these can include a lack of diverse input into decision-making or people having a privileged perspective, um, you know, the, bod the governing body who is making those decisions. A example uh, slide uh, as to how that often feels uh, when you're you're the cat and your opinions are not being taken into uh, consideration in the de decision making. And then there's one more that I'd like to add on to this list, uh, a personal favorite, and that is what I like to call pretend socialization of decision making. Now, what do I mean by that? What does socialization of decision making mean? Really, this is an idea that uh, has sort of gained steam um, in business, probably more than in medicine. That just refers to taking an idea and sort of socializing it within the company, uh, getting feedback from everyone before decisions are made and before you know any policy changes are uh, implemented. Now, that's great uh, when it occurs, and it probably can't occur with every single decision that needs to be made. It's just not efficient, but with important ones or ones where people are likely to have diverse opinions, it, this is probably what should happen. But pretend socialization of decision making is when there's sort of... Um, an attempt to make it look like this is happening. And, you know, I see this all the time just in various sort of committee meetings or sort of task forces that are uh, created or retreats where uh, people's ideas are gathered. But oftentimes you sort of have the sense that the um, decisions have already been predetermined. And it's a little bit of a distraction so that people feel like they have input when maybe they don't. And I feel like that's worse than just uh, discounting people's opinions in the first place when you sort of pretend to listen to them but aren't really. Why do I have a picture of a cow on this slide? Uh, the reason I have a picture of a cow on this slide is that I used to do um, veterinary medicine work in college before I decided to go to human medical school. And when you were working with cows, uh, you would literally sort of knock on the side of their face to, you know, like make a fist and knock on their face like a door uh, to distract them. And they would sort of look at you with this expression on their face, trying to figure out what you were doing to distract them from whatever you were doing that they might not like at the other end of the cow. And I think it's like a great analogy to pretend socialization of decision-making. I actually refer to some of these um, activities when I see them as cow knocking behaviors. It's just a distraction to sort of <laughs> keep people appeased. Um, and it doesn't usually go over well to making people feel like their opinions are actually valued. Now, what are the effects here? So we've gone over a list of some of these uh, effects of toxic behaviors already. I would say that probably the effects here fall more into the sort of first and last category where people tend to uh, tune out a bit. You get the decreased work effort. You get people like leaving if they don't feel like they are valued or like their values are represented by the institution. So you get sort of deinvestment as a coping mechanism. I think this category of behavior is probably less likely to induce like actual personal trauma, but it's still pulls people out of engagement, and it's not good for um, the practice, it's not good for the institution, it's not good for the individual. Now the other category is individual toxic behaviors, and I think this is where it can get really dangerous, and I have this sort of like evil octopus uh, picture um, with this octopus sort of taking down the 1800s era ship 
Um, and this is actually sort of how I, I view this sometimes, that you have like these people who just, these, you know, the evil octopus who can sort of send out all of these tentacles in different directions and cause all these little bits of sort of pain and trouble in the department. And you don't even like really understand how interconnected it all is or how much of it can arise from just that proverbial one bad apple. You know, I think there's real potential for disaster uh, when you've got that bad apple in the equation. There are probably two flavors here uh, as well um, of individual toxic behaviors. One is normal people doing bad things. That's probably the easier category to deal with because these people are more likely to be you know, apologetic, you know, self-reflective. It's probably easier to come to um, a resolution uh, in these instances. And then there's the category of disordered people doing bad things. And what I mean by that is probably people that have some something in the spectrum of a cluster B personality disorder, I think. Often um, that falls into the sort of spectrum of narcissistic personality disorder. And people with cluster B personality disorders um, are you know, up to 10% in the general population. And the few studies that have been done on this show that the, their prevalence is no fewer um, in the field of medicine. So what can these individual toxic behaviors look like? Some of them seem probably uh, on the more innocent side of the spectrum, things like self-promotion, uh, or a personal agenda, you know, it's fine to be ambitious, but you don't want to be sort of stomping on other people's backs uh, to get there. So uh, things that fall into that category, bullying and gossiping, manipulative behaviors, I mean, things we would recognize as being toxic in anyone uh, at work or not at work. And, you know, it can get into some pretty um, yucky stuff, uh, grooming of coworkers. And that can take on uh, multiple different forms. And it, it sounds sort of like, you know, weird sort of psycho babble, but you, you recognize these behaviors when you see them. So it's like someone uh, targeting a certain individual and sort of uh, fostering a relationship with them so that they can get something out of them, so that they can, you know, get them to write papers for them or so that they can use them as a ally in negotiations with leadership or, or, or whatever favor they want. Uh, sometimes people are... Um, soliciting supporters or allies among leadership because they think that those people will be more influential and in helping them in their careers. Uh, sometimes it's actually, um, you know, younger people, junior faculty who might be able to help them uh, or even, you know, residents. If you, you know, have all the residents adoring you, um, you know, that can end block be, you know, a, a good sort of like negotiating tactic, improving your uh, worth to the department. Uh, dividing and conquering, this is another sort of manipulative behavior that can occur, particularly in personality disordered people. So um, sort of trying to create division or discord between, you know, multiple different people in the department, usually, you know, for their benefit in some way. So what to do? Uh, it really depends on the severity of what you're dealing with. You know, is it just uh, an irritating and occasionally problematic, you know, kind of behavior that you're dealing with? Or is it actually rising to the level of abuse uh, and causing sustained trauma? If you're dealing with something less severe, then I think, you know, the conventional advice that you usually hear when you talk about toxic behaviors is reasonable. Um, you know, discuss it with the person. You know, talk to them directly. See if you can come to some sort of resolution. Uh, discuss the situation with a, a neutral mediator. Or, you know, eventually you could escalate it to discussing with departmental leadership. And it's probably, you know, likely that if you take it to departmental leadership, they're going to tell you to talk to the person or talk to a neutral mediator or something like this. And when it is in this less severe category, this is perfectly reasonable. But, you know, sometimes it's not. I mean, sometimes it is like really severe. It rises to the level of abuse. People are acutely traumatized. And in that case, like, you know, going to the person who's causing you the trauma, who's being abusive is, is, is maybe not the best course of action. And maybe you don't want to sit in a room with them. Uh, with a neutral mediator. I think that particularly when things rise to that severe level, uh, departmental leaders don't always see it. Uh, they don't necessarily realize that these toxic people are causing that degree of harm. And unfortunately, bad behavior can be ignored or even sometimes protected if the person is viewed as a high performer in some other way. So how do you cope uh, in that instance uh, where the sort of conventional advice fails? And I find that this sort of category of advice I'm going to launch into now really resonates with the people who have been in this sort of experience and uh, maybe does not really resonate if you have not been uh, in this sort of circumstance. Uh, so for all of your sakes, I hope it does not resonate with you um, but if the, because it means you haven't been put in this terrible situation. Uh, but if you ever are, you know, please uh, earmark it and come back to it. So my first piece of advice is to distance yourself. And I think, you know, anyone who has sort of like dealt with a um, 
you know, personality disordered or really narcissistic individual uh, in some other context, you know, your personal life sort of knows the advice of no contact, you know, just, you know, remove them from your life. Unfortunately, at work, that often means as close to no contact as possible. And uh, those are words to live by. You know, a lot of uh, tasks can be accomplished by email. There are ways to distance from yourself from someone, even if you still uh, have to effectively work with them in some capacity. And when that's the case, when you can't have complete distance, I think it's important to create some psychological distance. Uh, that can look like a lot of different things. Change anything you can. Uh, drive to work along a different route. <laughs> Enter the hospital through, you know, a different door. You know, anything you can make different, make different. Uh, it sounds sort of silly, but it can actually, um, I think, give you some sense of control in your ability to uh, change circumstances at work. And then targeted leaning out. So, you know, maybe work doesn't have to be your whole world, you know, when something like this is going on. When you go home, put the laptop away. Focus on other things. Focus on friends. Focus on family. Focus on your hobbies. Just try not to think about it as much as possible. Put your foot down. Now, this can be hard, um, but you need to sort of look out for yourself, make demands, and set boundaries about what you are uh, and are not comfortable with going forward. I know I was put in a, a, a position where I was basically told I had to work with uh, someone who I was just unwilling uh, to work with any longer. And, um, you know, first of all, I think you, you want to sort of like document what's going on, you know, document uh, the abusive behavior so you have a record of it, even if you don't plan to report it. I mean, you may have that option, but um, document it. And remember that you do have the ability to say no. And I like to say this is, it's funny, it's like toddlers know this and they have it like completely down. But I think as adults, we sometimes lose our capacity for just saying no, particularly when it's at work. But you do have to sort of take care of yourself in this sort of situation. And if you are not willing to work with someone, you can say, no, I'm not willing to be in the same room with this person. I will, you know, get the work done. I will, uh, you know, work with them via email. Um, but if people aren't really aware of what's going on, you know, you sort of have to look out for yourself and uh, make the best decisions and set the best boundaries for you and your personal healing. Do good. Now, this can take on a couple different forms. And I feel like when people sort of set boundaries and get away from someone who is treating them badly uh, at work, there's almost like a survivor guilt that sort of takes over where you sort of feel like, okay, I've gotten myself out of this position, but now I know they're going to go on and do it to other people. And you sort of feel like you need to sort of anticipate and protect these people so the same thing doesn't happen uh, to them. I know that I personally tried this with several people, and it often was actually reasonably well received. Um, but that does keep you engaged. It keeps you sort of thinking about the situation. And, you know, what if they leave the institution? What if they go on somewhere else? You can't follow them around for the rest of their life trying to, you know, save everyone around them. Um, so the do good probably shouldn't fall into that category. It's too uh, unreasonable a burden. But somebody I know from um, another institution uh, told me that the way she dealt with this after, you know, having a similar situation was that she just tried to do good kind of randomly, sort of in the category of random acts of kindness. So she, you know, put a lot of effort into mentoring medical students. She, you know, did, you know, just things outside of her job, things that uh, were a way to sort of just karmically give back um, without having to sort of follow around the abusive person and try and save people from them specifically. Do the work. Now, I think it's good uh, in these sort of um, times of turmoil uh, to sort of take a step back and think about why did you go into this job in the first place? What are you trying to get out of it? Uh, and it's probably something, you know, on this list, you know, helping patients or you wanted to have clinical expertise, you had interest in education or you have real sort of research or academic interests and focus on those things. Like pick something that's really meaningful to you in your work and Put your energy there. Focus on that. Do it for yourself, not for the institution, not for, you know, your promotion. Just do what is meaningful for you in your work. Personal power check. Eleanor Roosevelt said that no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. And this is a real toughie. Um, once you have set boundaries and sort of gotten away, you know, from a person who um, is causing you trauma uh, like this, uh, particularly if you're dealing with someone with narcissistic tendencies, it, it's a pretty common reaction that once they can't control you anymore, uh, they try and control how other people see you. So smear campaigns um, at, are, are very common, and it's, it can be a terrible thing at work. You know, you've just sort of extracted yourself from this situation, and now someone's, you know, saying all of this terrible stuff, uh, you know, about you to everyone at work, and it, you know, may be completely untrue. Um, and you're 
instinct is going to be to sort of like run around and defend yourself and say like, oh no, this person's actually like, you know, this crazy toxic abuser and you know, this, oh, this is all a lie. And, uh, you know, ultimately that number one sort of makes you look crazy. And most of the time they have probably like primed these people already to believe their story. Um, so it probably isn't very effective to run around and try and try and uh, counteract the gossip. Um, it's actually probably better to just sort of take a step back and practice the mantra of, I don't care what other people think about me. And I don't know if any of you um, are familiar with Brene Brown, but this is something she talks about, that this is actually a really hard thing to hack. And people like to sort of go around and say, I don't care what anyone thinks about me, but it's really not true. I mean, most of the time you do still care what other people think about you. And it is um, hurtful when people are saying, you know, negative things about you to others at work, particularly if you feel like they're completely untrue. But what uh, Brene Brown also says is the way to sort of deal with it is to only care what some people think about you. Pick a select few, the people who actually know you, the people who know what's going on, the truth of the situation, and focus on that, focus on their feedback. And really, even though it seems counterintuitive, you kind of just have to let uh, the smear campaign go. Uh, don't stay engaged. Don't think about it. You know, go home, focus on other things, and, you know, eventually they will lose interest. Take care of yourself. And this is probably, um, you know, one of the most important pieces of advice. You know, oh, this is hard stuff. It's, it, it's hard to deal with. And it takes time. Um, and I remember when I was going through this terrible time at work, I kept saying to people, I just need time. And th the data sort of supports that when you've really been traumatized like this, whether it's at work or in your personal life, uh, it probably takes about two years before you really start feeling better. Um, so you need to give yourself time. You need to engage in self-care, sort of all of these different, you know, elements that we're seeing depicted on this slide. Um, I bought myself a puppy <laughs> when I was uh, sort of in this stage. But, you know, eventually things uh, do get better. Um, healing can occur. Sometimes the toxic people leave, uh, and sometimes they learn to leave you alone uh, if you set your boundaries firmly and um, are no longer willing to be uh, a victim. So again, I hope uh, most people don't need this advice, um, but if you are someone who has found yourself in this sort of situation, I hope uh, that this was helpful. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. First of all, I want to thank the AUR organizers for the invitation to give this presentation. And especially, I want to thank Dr. Kate Klein, the organizer of this panel. Today, I'll be speaking to you about our LGBTQ plus learners and how to create a supportive environment for them. I have no financial disclosures. So briefly, I'm going to talk about the LGBTQ history and literature uh, review around medical uh, trainees just to give you a flavor about why it's so important that we uh, foster a supportive environment for our LGBTQ trainees. I'm going to talk about some roadblocks and solutions to creating this environment and also some resources that you could utilize. So LGBTQ individuals were uh, prosecuted and exterminated by the Nazis in the, during World War II, and they were identified by a pink triangle, which is why the symbol has become so important to the LGBTQ uh, community. Homosexuality was classified as a psychiatric disease until 1973, so that's only uh, four years before I was born. And of note, gender dysphoria, which means that you're born of one gender but identified as another gender, is still characterized as a psychiatric disorder. And in fact, you need this diagnosis to get uh, gender reassignment surgery. So as most of you know, um, LGBTQ communities have a lot of health disparities and poor health outcomes as, as compared to their uh, non-LGBTQ uh, peers, they have a lot of psychiatric disorders such as drug abuse, depression, anxiety, increased rates of suicide, and also um, physical disorders such as cardiovascular disease, obesity, increased risks of certain cancers. But what about our LGBTQ trainees? What is the literature? What does the literature say? So there are multiple reports. That have described this. Uh, just this is one sample of NAMA in 2017, sent a survey out to a, around 630 medical students 
and basically anti-LGBTQ discrimination was witnessed by 14.6% of respondents and heterosexism by 31.1% of responders. Of those responders that identified as LGBTQ, they were more likely to perceive um, the anti-LGBTQ uh, discrimination and heterosexism. Um, while about half of those that identified as LGBTQ were comfortable uh, disclosing their identity to their classmates, they were not uh, as likely to do so to their attending physicians. And um, fairly disturbingly, around 41.7% reported anti-LGBTQ jokes, rumors, and some bullying both by their peers and by others in the healthcare team, including attending physicians, which of course is uh, completely acceptable. So what about LGBTQ trainees in radiology? What has been published in the literature? So far, I have not found um, any uh, published reports uh, describing uh, what LGBTQ trainees go through in radiology. So I think this is an area of opportunity. Or if anyone knows of any literature, please, uh, I, I'd be very interested in hearing about it. So what are some roadblocks? I'm not gonna do an extensive um, overview, but some, uh, you know, some of the ones that we need to be aware of. So of course, there's a generational divide. I'm Generation X. Most of our trainees are millennials or Generation uh, Z. They are much more more comfortable with LGBTQ community. They've been exposed a lot a whole lot more to it in the media and the movies uh, in the culture in general whereas for me for example the first um uh you know shows that demonstrated uh, lgbtq as something normal were will and grace and the l word uh, at the turn of the century Another roadblock um, is that there are a significant number of, of terms that we need to be very familiar with and understand. Um, in my time, we had lesbian, gay, and bisexual. Of course, that didn't mean that other um, identities didn't exist. We just really didn't have names for them. And of course, today we have an alphabet soup of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, transsexual, queer, questioning intersex, ally, asexual, and pansexual, that uh, all terms that we need to be very familiar with and understand. Another roadblock is pronouns. Um, again, when I was younger, it was binary, he, she, hers, his. And of course, today we have a plethora of uh, gender pronouns. This list is by no means um, comprehensive. So the most important thing to understand is that we need to let the trainees identi identify themselves and uh, use the pronoun that they feel most comfortable with and we should not make assumptions about that. As well, identity um, has become, uh, in terms of terminology, a little bit more complicated. Again, it doesn't mean that they didn't exist before. We just have more language for it today. So in my time, it was lesbian, gay, bisexual, male, female. And today we have the spectrum, right? So we have to understand that how uh, identity is understood nowadays. It's not only through your biological sex, but also through your gender identity, your gender expression, your gender presentation and sexual orientation. So for example, I can be a cis female, which means I was born female sex have a gender identity of male, but still uh, express my gender as feminine, um, and have a gender presentation of a woman, but um, be lesbian and be attracted only to uh, females. So it's very important to understand that, um, you know, identity is uh, a whole lot more uh, com broader, or there's more broader terminology to express it, and we should not make assumptions about people's identity just because they look or act a certain way. I think the most insidious roadblock that we have is visibility or invisibility. Uh, we need to make a better effort to have signage uh, demonstrating uh, our uh, inclusiveness, not only for the LGBT community, but for all communities. Um, 
have programming, have uh, safe zone stickers, have um, rainbow flags or other identifiers that uh, express our uh, support for our LGBTQ trainees and uh, community at large. Another important roadblock is that our trainees through medical school have uh, strong, robust med pride groups and then they graduate into residency or fellowship and they don't have a dedicated LGBTQ support group. So this is something that can be addressed with our ACGME office and it's something to keep um, in mind that uh, our trainees, especially at the beginning, would come from a very supportive environment with their LGBTQ peers into a, a, an environment that doesn't have that support anymore. So again, what are some solutions that we can utilize? So the most important one is that we have to educate ourselves, right? It is our responsibility as teachers and as academic departments to make sure we understand what the issues are and to provide adequate training. And how do we do that? We can do that through mandatory safe zone training or other online modules such as the Fenway Institute or UCSF LGBTQ uh, programming that's available and free online. We can use inclusive signage to indicate our support, inclusive language, and for that again, we need to really understand um, the complexity of the terminology um, and what it means, and more importantly, not apply it and not assume, let the trainee identify themselves um, as they see fit. We can network with our wider university of LGBTQ resources. Most of our institutions have a, an LGBTQ center we can go to, etc. We again can consider approaching our ACGME office to create a dedicated LGBTQ uh, interest group for our fellows and residents in radiology. We can network with other institutions such as UCSF LGBTQ uh, Resource Center that have already a robust uh, system in place uh, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We need to promote this topic at na national uh, chapter conferences such as this one. It's very important that we address this in as many forums as possible. And finally, consider applying uh, for the Health Equity Index designation from the Human Rights Campaign. Uh, that way your hospital or home institution is identified uh, as a medical system that is proficient and culturally competent in LGBTQ issues. So some uh, resources that you can utilize are, again, the National LGBT Health Education Center or the Fenway program some safe zone training, which would uh, give uh, basic understanding to all your faculty and staff uh, about LGBTQ issues, WAMC LGBT, uh, LGBT um, resources, the UCSF LGBT uh, health resources, and the Human Rights Campaign Health Equity Index resource. I wanna thank you all for attention. I wanna thank you for being interested in this very important uh, um, topic that really does affect the health um, and the resilience of our trainees. And again, I thank you for your time. Hello, I'm Caroline Carrico, and I'm glad to have this opportunity to discuss with you the radiology standardized letter of recommendation for use in the radiology residency match. During this talk, we will discuss briefly some features of narrative versus standardized letters, describe the development of the radiology standardized letter, and review how to use the standardized letter of recommendation. We'll also review the results of the 2020 AUR and APDR survey regarding the standardized letter of recommendation. Letters of recommendation are a typical element in any radiology residency match application. The author of the letter may choose to use a narrative free form format or may choose to follow the template of a standardized letter. Narrative letters that are strong have these basic elements. They'll describe the writer's background, rank, and experience. 
as well as the length and context of the author's relationship with the student. The applicant's qualifications for a given residency will be described, and in very strong letters, specific concrete examples of the applicant's personal traits, performance, and skills that make them a strong candidate for a given residency will also be discussed. The letter may provide insight into unique features of the candidate and compare the applicant to current peers and predecessors. In the end, a global recommendation with a reference range may be given. While narrative letters are quite useful, analysis of narrative letters has described several negative elements that could be improved upon. Oftentimes they contain excessive praise and flattery. They can be hard to interpret. There may be a hierarchy of praise phrasing or code words that are used by the author that may not have the same meaning to the person who's reading the letter. So there's often low inter-reader reliability. The letters may be redundant and simply restate information that's stated elsewhere in the application. They've been shown to have elements of gender bias, they contribute to reader fatigue, and they do not predict clinical performance. With this in mind, standardized letters of recommendation have been developed. They have also been used for several years in different residency programs, including otolaryngology and dermatology. And literature in these two fields have described many benefits of the standardized letter of recommendation. The standardized letter is faster to interpret, saving one minute per letter per the dermatology literature. They also take less time to write with an average of less than five minutes to write in the otolaryngology literature. Both fields describe a higher inter-rater reliability. And in the dermatology literature, it is noted that there's a less exaggeration of positive traits and that more points of information regarding the status of the author and their relationship with the student are defined within the standardized letter. Standardized letters of recommendation have been used in the emergency medicine program match for 20 years. In 2014, Dr. Love published the results of a survey that was sent to the Council of Emergency Medicine Residency Directors, in which 94.3% of program directors participated. 99.3% of the program directors supported the standardized letter of recommendation as an evaluative tool. Impressively, 92.7% stated that the standardized letter of recommendation was the number one element in the application that they used as a decision to interview an applicant. At this point, the standardized letter of recommendation had been in use for 12 years. At the 2017 annual meeting of the Association of University Radiologists, Dr. Kadar Jambaker and Dr. Anna Lorenko and I discovered that we were undergoing parallel development of a standardized letter of recommendation for use in the radiology residency match. We decided to join efforts and we applied for and were awarded an AUR Venture Fund grant to develop the first radiology residency match standardized letter of recommendation. Our first draft was developed after a review of the literature and reviewing the structure of other standardized letters of recommendation. The Alliance of Medical Student Educators in Radiology had formed a task force and they reviewed our preliminary letter and gave us assessment and feedback. And also the survey of this group helped to determine the top qualities that were sought in radiology residency candidates. 
Our third draft was informed based on feedback from an expanded task force that included members of the Alliance of Medical Student Educators in Radiology, as well as those from the Alliance of Clinical Educators in Radiology and the Association of Program Directors in Radiology. Ultimately, input was received from 80 radiology educators. The summer of 2018, the standardized letter was posted on the AUR website. An announcement and link to the letter was emailed to AUR and APDR members. The document was a modifiable PDF and some letter writers experienced technical difficulties and had file sizes too large for upload to EROS. In 2019, the letter was reformatted to a modifiable Word document. EROS support staff also volunteered free assistance to all letter writers who needed reformatting of their letters for upload. Also, updated instructions for use of the letter were posted on the AUR website. So this is the current form of our standardized letter of recommendation. It is a modifiable Word document. I'll show you briefly how the letter is used. So the first portion of the letter is basic information about the student and the author. One thing that's nice is when the author fills out their basic demographics, they can then save the letter to their desktop and then fill in the specifics for a given student applicant on subsequent versions of the letter. So once the basic contact information is filled in, the author can also share information about their teaching experience their years of teaching, and the number of medical students that they assess or evaluate each year. In the instructions, it clarifies that the number of students that you assess may be very different from the number of students that you teach. For instance, if you teach in a traditional lecture setting, you may lecture to one or 200 students, but in a traditional lecture, you don't often have the opportunity for very much meaningful interaction. So you would not say that you assessed those 100 or 200 students. Rather, the assessment number indicated in the standardized letter indicates that number of students that you spend enough time with to have a meaningful evaluation of their skills. And then for the given applicant, you can indicate what form that interaction took, whether it was clinical or research or other. In section two, the author is asked to comment on applicants' actions and traits that are routinely demonstrated. And they're asked to comment on the six areas that were felt to be most important for a radiology resident. They were looking for medical students that can communicate effectively, demonstrate a strong work ethic, exhibit intellectual curiosity, possess a strong fund of medical knowledge, show leadership, and can work well with a team. Section two, the author is also asked to indicate if they are comparing the student to all medical students that they have ever worked with or if they're comparing only to students that they've worked with in the last five years. In this example, we will indicate that the author is comparing this student to all medical students they've worked with throughout their career. The author is also instructed to provide a concrete example in the narrative section for any quality or trait that the student rates in the top 91 to 100th percentile. So for this example, we will say that the author believes that this student communicates very effectively, 
but they do not have any examples that come to mind that they can illustrate in the narrative section. But they still want to indicate to the reader that this student communicates very well. So they may place an X in this 81 to 90 percentile box, or they could type in a specific number. When it comes to a strong work ethic, the author believes that this student not only has a strong work ethic, but has the strongest work ethic they have ever seen in a student in their entire career. So if this is truly the single best example of a person with a strong work ethic this author has ever seen, they can put a 100 in the 91 to 100 percentile box. In doing so, they should have concrete examples that they are willing to share and will share in the narrative section. The third section is global assessment. Again, you're going to indicate if you are comparing to all medical students or just students you've worked with in the last five years and place an X to indicate which population you are comparing this candidate to. And again, we're going to say this was our strongest candidate we have worked with ever in our career. We would place a 100 there. Now you can only give one student a 100. Um, otherwise, you are not using the scale appropriately. The fourth and final section is the narrative section. In this area, you would describe those top 10 percentile qualities and traits that you delineated in section two as being held by your candidate. You also can provide insight into some unique qualities of the candidate. Perhaps they have a skill set or strength that will be useful in residency that has not previously been mentioned. Maybe they have a special relevant interest outside of medicine, or you can provide other supportive information that is not found elsewhere in the application. A 300 word limit is suggested, but it's not required. The text box is expandable. When you've completed the letter, you would print the letter, physically sign the letter, and then create a PDF of the letter that is less than one megabyte in size to upload to EROS. In 2020, we created a survey to send to the AUR and APDR members to assess the user awareness of the availability of the standardized letter of recommendation as well as its real and potential use, its usefulness, and its composition. This survey had two parts. The first part was 11 brief questions to assess the awareness, use, usefulness of the standardized letter. The second part gave the survey taker the opportunity to offer suggestions for improvement regarding the composition and elements of the letter. The survey was sent to AUR and APDR members mid-March of 2020. This was a very tumultuous time. Nonetheless, 40 of the 112 APDR members responded to the survey, and this was the largest demographic that responded. We asked about receipt of standardized letters of recommendation in 2018 compared with 2019. In 2019, 76.7% of the survey respondents stated that they did receive at least one standardized letter of recommendation and the letters were received in greater numbers. For instance, in 2018, only 3.6 percent of respondents received more than 25 letters, but in 2019 that had more than doubled to 8.1 percent. We also asked in the survey 
if you wrote letters if you chose to use the standardized letter of recommendation when writing. And the, the majority did not. As a matter of fact, 72.7% .7 said that they never used the letter and 13.6% said that they always used the letter. Inquiring further to those that did not use the letter, we were pleased to see that Technical difficulty uploading the letter was not a factor in the last residency match as reported by this survey or by way of feedback to the AUR. A large portion of those that did not use the standardized letter simply did not write letters, 26.4%. An important 12.5% were not aware that the letter even existed as an option. A large portion, 36.1%, did not like the format, and in the free text or other option, others expressed that they preferred their own template. We also asked in the survey if our respondents were aware that standardized letters were used in the dermatology, otolaryngology, orthopedic surgery, and emergency medicine residency matches. And 60% of the respondents were not aware of the use of the standardized letter in those programs. So this is the form of our standardized letter of recommendation, just to show you as a comparison to the templates of other standardized letters that are currently in use. And I know the text is small, and you won't be able to read specifically, but it gives you an idea of the layout and the template. So here is the orthopedic surgery standardized letter, otolaryngology, dermatology, for the emergency medicine residency program, over the two decades, they have evolved their standardized letter of recommendation now to be a standardized letter of evaluation. Those responding to the survey were also asked to indicate what benefits they perceived from the standardized letter of recommendation. Again, these were not quantified assessments of actual letters or assessments of the time and effort it took to read, write, and analyze the letters as those studies have not yet been performed. But these again were the perceived benefits of those who are completing the survey. So the top indications were easier to read, easier to interpret, saves time and is easier to write. A smaller but still substantial number stated and indicated that they felt it facilitated rating the candidates, had greater inter-rater reliability, and was more transparent. They also indicated that it provided more concrete examples of the candidate's strength and to a lesser extent, concrete examples of the candidate's weaknesses. It was felt that the letter is more objective, allows less praise inflation and a little less grade inflation and also limits gender bias. Those that responded to the survey were also asked to indicate perceived drawbacks for the standardized letter. 66% indicated that it had a less personal format. 38% expressed concerns about how the letter would be perceived by program directors. 21% stated that it is new and untested in radiology. 19% indicated that they did not know the candidates well enough to give specific examples 
of traits as requested in the standardized letter. Other important points were that 17% did not realize that the ERAS support staff would help reformat letters, and an important 14% did not know how to locate the letter. When asked if they would be willing to submit standardized letters that were used in the match to be anonymized and analyzed and have the data assessed, 12% indicated that they would be willing to participate in such studies. As far as part two of the survey, suggestions for structural modification of the survey, we had zero respondents. In the survey, we also asked about the importance of letters of recommendation in general as far as interview selection. 9.2% thought that it was extremely important. It was the main factor that they used. But a larger 39.1% said they were only moderately important and 27.6% said they were only important if they were extreme. 17.2% rarely use the letter as a deciding factor. As far as other comments, it was noted that they have increased value if the reader knows the writer, or if the letter declares a particularly strong candidate or hints at a suboptimal candidate. They also asked the survey takers to speculate if the letter of recommendation may become more important after the step one exam becomes a pass-fail exam. And 76.1% felt that there would either be a moderate or a marked increase in the importance of letters of recommendation. So some summary observations. The program directors responded to the survey in the greatest proportion. For the second year that the standardized letter was used, the use was increased and technical difficulties were not reported, not to the AUR or via the survey. Many do not like the template. There is still a relative lack of awareness of the availability of the standardized letter of recommendation in both the radiology match as well as in other subspecialties. Letters of recommendation in general are moderately useful in candidate selection, but the importance may increase after step one exam becomes pass-fail. So we have current efforts and future plans for the standardized letter. First, we do need to continue to increase awareness. The letter will be emailed to the AUR and APDR members, and those members will be encouraged to share the email with the link to all of their faculty at their institution and to share beyond and outside their institution. A manuscript regarding the standardized letter is in progress. We also will continue to gather feedback through the AUR. And you can send feedback to aur at rsna.org. And in the subject line, please put SLOR feedback. As far as finding the letter, if you don't go by the email, you can go to aur.org and click on the resources tab or type in aur.org backslash en backslash resources. When you click on the resources tab, you'll find the tab for the standardized letter of recommendation. And when you click on that, you'll be taken to a page where you're provided both the instructions for the standardized letter of recommendation as well as the letter itself. Our future goals, so we wish to perform institutional or multi-institutional studies to assess the letter. We hope to have roundtable or panel discussions at the next annual meeting of the Association of University Radiologists. We'd like to or perceive in the future that there may be an AUR standardized letter of recommendation committee. 
This committee would be responsible for promoting and monitoring the use of the letter. It would periodically survey the membership to direct modifications made to the letter and improve letter usefulness as culture and needs change. They may wish to develop variants of the letter. There could be a letter for interventional radiology, a separate letter to be filled out by non-radiologist MDs who are supporting radiology candidates, or a group letter could be developed. Also, we need to consider the big picture. Do we need standardized letters of recommendation and or do we need standardized letters of evaluation? Special thanks to my co-authors, Dr. Anna Lorenko and Dr. Kadar Jambaker. Thank you to those that responded to the AUR and APDR survey and those that served on the task force with development of the initial letter. Thank you to the AUR Research and Education Foundation for their support through the Venture Fund grant. And thanks to Carrie O'Connor, our RSNA Administrative Assistant these last two years. Thanks also to Grayson Baird, Matthew Henry, Melinda Thompson, and Teresa Thomas, who helped us respectively with survey development, letter reformatting, editorial assistance, and administrative assistance. And thanks to you. Thank you very much for your time and your attention. Comments and suggestions are welcomed. Please send them to aur at rsna.org. And in the subject line, put SLOR feedback. Also, please look for the letter at the AUR website at aur.org backslash en backslash resources. Thank you.